Okay. Good. So shall we move this out here? Um, okay. So I I titled it the imperative, uh, energy imperatives in 2024. There as hopefully a, a prop there to to talk a little bit more about what do we need to do to decarbonize. Uh, our economy. And there's a couple of things there which become very much apparent as you look at it from the perspective of what are the levers that we have to tweak there in order to get the carbon out of our economy. And I'd like to start off there with this three-legged store, a uh, stool uh, that is indicative of uh, technological progress. So it's predicated on each of the legs there, technology, markets, and policy and regulation. And this university is very much known there for technology. They're very smart people developing new widgets, new products, and they're coupling it with markets to make a product out of it, to be able just to, to reach profitability startup companies, right? This is what this is all about here at this university in Silicon Valley. And policy is sometimes, and regulation is sort of a stepchild uh, often. Sometimes it's induced, induces uh, new technology developments, you know, particularly now with decarbonization, you know, clean technology, we all need to, to work on it. Um, but in the process, it becomes sort of a stepchild. And so if you, if one thing I want to get across today is that the smartest and the brightest are needed in this policy design and how to design regulatory system to advance technological progress. So that is my, my, my key message. And let me take you on a little journey. And the journey will first talk about where are we in the transition where do we need to go? How fast do we need to go to get there? And then spend quite a bit of time on, on the trade-off of central plant versus distributed. Where do we put our emphasis as far as generating the clean electrons that we then consume in, in sustenance and in, in comfort in our homes, in transportation services, and making products? And then finish out there with some uh, final thoughts there on what we ought to be doing next. So here uh, you're seeing the trend there in the last uh, 50 years of the CO2 emissions in the United States. It has crept up there because of economic development. We built more widgets, we built more homes, we had more population there, more vehicles, vehicle miles traveled. And so it has inclined up to about 2005. It leveled out for three years, and then 2008, with the recession, it precipitously uh, dropped down. It's been dropping down ever since, not because of the aftermath of a re recession, but state laws kicked in, and we had now um, federal grants there for implementing and deploying uh, clean energy technologies, and that has taken us on a progressive uh, slope uh, down. But we, we have to go further. So what will the journey look like that is shown here, projected out to 2035 and 2045 or 2050? Very steep, very steep. Steeper than you know, growing up. So what does that mean is whatever we're doing, we need to make the changes more rapidly than what we have made that got us uh, to the carbon emissions. We've done at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory a study there that looked at how would you decarbonize the electric power system in the United States from a transmission perspective. We've done this at PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, collaboratively with our friends from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Um, and I want to give you a couple of highlights from it that hopefully raises your awareness of what we are up against. 
And so it looked at from a through the lens of transmission. Why transmission? Well, there was particular reasons. One of the reasons is, is we have not really built much of it to really access these low cost, high wind, good solar resources and brought them to the load centers. And um, so transmission was big black hole there that we needed to somehow fill. And we looked at it um, from a transmission planning perspective. So there were different scenarios that you can see on the left-hand side. They looked at different planning strategies from only optimizing within a zone uh, in the balancing in the, in the balancing area zone to FERC 1000 regions, which are larger planning regions, to interconnections to let's build the whole new grid, which is then here the multi-terminal a point uh, on the bottom as an overlay. What I'd like to pay your attention to is some of these growth scenarios. So we hypothesized um, a grid in 2035 or 2045 with the expected electricity demands. So we all know is if you want to decarbonize the end use sectors, you have to electrify more. So, um, that means electric vehicles, electric trucks. That means heat pumps in uh, in buildings and uh, whatever you need to do there in the industrial sector. So if you really look at it, how much more electricity do we need to generate to meet all of these new demands? It is about twice as much as we're currently using by 2000, whenever we're fully electrified twice as much, um, and, and that is a steep, that's a steep hill to climb up. It's particularly steep if it has taken us 140 years to get to where we are now. So now we're doubling it in 25, 20 to 25 years. So that's one item. One of the takeaways of this analysis was this, Regardless of how you optimize the system, whether you're looking at wide area networks where you increase your degrees of freedom across the entire nation with sort of a great overlay, or you make it smaller regionally, we need to have four and a half, uh, two and a half, about three and a half more transmission capabilities. But you express this in Giga uh, in gigawatts miles, so that is sending a gigawatt over a mile. So take that transmission system that we currently have and make it two and a half to three times larger. So how much more generators do we need? So if the coals are being the coal technology is being phased out, fossil fuels. Uh, there's not many oil power plants, oil boilers out there, but natural gas boilers out, all dispatchable, uh, and you replace it with wind and solar primarily, you need about three times more. You're going from a 1100 gigawatt system to about 2000 gigawatt system. And um, so that is a threefold increase. And so you can see here some, some other manifestation of how, how we need to map this all out. And again, you know, nuances there um, can be teased out there as to what the right planning strategies are. The bottom line of all of this is, is as we are reaching out to a wider network, as the planning occurs more on a national basis, which we've never really done before. We've never done transmission planning on a national basis. It's all within balancing areas where people have jurisdiction and ownership over. That's how we're expanding out. But if we were to do it, we're increasing our net present value or savings compared to how we're doing trans, uh, transmission planning today. So you're seeing here the Multi-terminal, that was this building, basically an overlay of a grid, has the biggest 
uh, savings about half a trillion over the next uh, 20 years. So more transmission is desirable. Okay. I need to go to the next one. So let me wrap this, this up. What we learned from this is that the magnitude of this national transmission planning study showed, and that was only for a 90% electrification by 2030, three times more generation capabilities, three times more transmission capabilities. What has taken us to get to where we are 100% has taken us 140 years. We need to do this two times over in addition, or we only have 25 years left. So that, that is a challenge we're up against. So to get a reality check on the transmission side is, we built the last big line in the West, the San, Sanzia line from New Mexico through Arizona into California to provide California with the clean electrons has taken us 17 years. Okay, so it's pretty clear is if we're going at that pace, we're not going to get done. Something has to give. FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, who is responsible for interstate commerce uh, and transmission planning, you know, is already realizing is we need to hasten the, sp uh, the, uh, the pace. We need to have some rules and regulations that, that accelerates these planning activities. And one of the things is really is you got to increase your forecasting horizon longer than what has traditionally been done, which is the next 10 years. So by looking only 10 years out, so you haven't really seen these big targets hitting in 2050. Right? So you're always operating as if you don't see the target. You're blind. Um, and if you do this, you now need to set the trajectory much lower than, than what has been done in the past. There are a whole lot of other coordination activities there in this firm order. And then distributed generation needs to be part of the solution set. Okay. So I'm I'm want to transition a little bit and look at this central plant the way we've done business versus distributed resources. And so this shows here how we as human beings have dealt with energy being provided to us to do useful things. So on the y-axis, you see most distributed up on top in green and most central on the bottom. And then so the time scale on the y-axis. So as hunter and, and gatherers there, we just collected wood, right? And dunk, what people are still doing in Africa to cook your meal, right? So everybody was totally autonomous, totally distributed, right? And then in 1882 is, is Edison, you know, built the first power plant, DC there, and electrified homes and some street lamps. And Werner Siemens did in, in Berlin few years later. And then you built out more and more. And so the first big aggregation there of networks was PGM, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. So these three, orga these three organizations, that's New Jersey Service, Power and Light uh, Company, Philadelphia Light Company, and Pennsylvania Power and Light, they interconnect their system in order to have more resilience. There's nothing computer controlled. Computers came in 1950. So here they just networked it so that they could build bigger plants. But by building bigger plants is when they run and they didn't need the electricity, the electrons had to go somewhere. And the wider the network, the more degrees of flexibility you have. And so this started a trend there toward economy of scale. Power plants were made bigger. That is why we have nuclear power plants in the gigawatt sites, right? Big coal power plants, big gas plants. But the economy of scale gets us to bigger and bigger systems, one, one network. But the ease of deployment 
as we just saw there in, in the previous study, getting big transmission plan uh, planning time. So if you, if the transaction cost of putting something on your rooftop is the fastest, it, it just takes your decision to say yes. You know, in a week, in two weeks, you can have photovoltaics up on you. So it can be done much more easily if you go distributed. And so what we're seeing is sort of a re resurgence. And so in California, rooftops, you know, are a pretty big uh, capacity contribution. In Germany, in 2009, they added more capacity in, in photovoltaics because of some incentives than on central power plants. So the question now is, is as we're now driving the change to, to a clean electricity system, to a clean energy system, how do we deal between central plant that has economy of scale, drives costs down, distribute it. You get the job done, but it's more expensive. So what does it mean from an investment perspective? And so let me show you here some slides on what we have done there on distributed energy. And we asked the question really is, is if you look at, at transactive energy system, which is basically enabling the to participate in balancing the electricity supply and providing electricity. He or she needs to be compensated appropriately. And you basically now, from an economic perspective, and we have one economist there, right? Um, so you have a supply curve, and that includes central plants, all of the big and utility operated um, resources, as well as individually owned resources. And so where they supply, uh, where they intersect, that's the clearing, market clearing uh, price. How can you drive that market clearing price down uh, given all of the resources that you have and assuming that you have participating customers there that like to engage in this? And so we did a simulation for the footprint of Texas. Texas is an isolated system, fairly relatively small footprint. Um, it has its own balancing, of, balancing authority. It's not interconnected with anything itself. So we simulated generation, we simulated the transmission, the distribution, the customers down to the actual assets. We looked at how do you need to coordinate it on a minute by minute basis to balance out all the various that you're now getting from wind and solar uh, to meet the loads. So we started off there in the top left there with building models. So we have a building model with thermal representation of how the building functions, right? Somebody gets up in the morning, turns on the thermostat, does things, takes showers, etc., and uses electricity. And so we multiplied this and populated this into a neighborhood, into a distribution system and calibrated this to a substation so that we're representing as much reality as, as we could. And so now we're getting a system there that represents the demand very well, very precisely. So we also looked at wholesale prices on the generation, the generation side. We had a generation dispatch model that says, okay, these are the demands. This is what I need to do for my generators to meet the demand up there with wholesale prices and you iterate because as the prices changes, the customer may change because the customer will see uh, the wholesale prices or some price information then and, and may respond accordingly. So if you do all of this, you get this Sankey diagram where you're seeing is here on the left-hand side are the generators and the generator Electrons generated moves through the system, and on the right hand side are the end users. And so you're seeing here some of the generators there. Those are rooftop units go strict, go straight to the customers. These are distributed system, and then to certain end, end loads. We also followed, yeah. 
we looked at the outcome, you know, that is the intersection of demand and supply on a minute by minute basis. They are this, what you recognize is you can actually lower the system demand by about 10%. So that means is I don't need to build out my grid as much. <clears throat> I can utilize my entire infrastructure much better by pushing down the peaks and shifting it into the load valleys in the evening. We looked at also how does the money flow? Who is selling to whom? And what are the transaction of money to exercise the purchasing of electricity, all the ancillary services to keep the grid up, um, and then also the capacity payments that I need to make uh, for additional assets. And so you see on the left-hand side, the customer, what the customer pays by classification, and the energy charge, you know, what are the retail charges, what are the, def the revenues from a distribution system. And so the point here, that you're seeing is, is even if you have zero marginal generation, so wind plan that for the kilowatt hour does not require any fuel costs or any operating costs, minimal for maintenance, even if you cut out the cost of energy, the cost of capacity there, still leave quite a bit of cost there for building out the infrastructure there. Uh, and the cost for balancing and orchestrating so that you maintain frequency and that you maintain voltage. So this is some simulation. A bunch of people played the sample. And so the bottom line of this is what we usually like to hear is, so what's the bottom line? Particularly from a customer. <clears throat> And so you're seeing here on the left-hand side, understanding where the benefits are. So there's some benefits there in capacity payments. So you don't pay as much in your bill for building a new power plant, building new transmission lines, building new distribution lines. Um, and so you're seeing here the benefits in green, and you're seeing some additional costs, and these are the net benefits in blue. If you ask the question of, okay, not everybody wants to be in the game of being a prosumer there, engaging in the market as a homeowner. I just want to have a house. I just want to have it heated, right? But if I have an electric vehicle, I just want to plug in and drive. I don't want to mess around there with selling and buying power there. I just want to have electricity. We are a grandmother. So you're seeing it here on the right-hand side. We looked at customers engaged in it and what on average they um, they profited or they saved on their bills in blue, those are the participants. And then there were uh, about 50% who were non-participants. So what you're seeing is there's a free rider that did it. So it's also good for people who say, is, I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. The reason being is that now the system is being utilized to much higher efficiency. So you, you get more stuff done with the infrastructure and the capital investments you have paid for. Okay, so that is really a key outcome. So how do we now operationalize this? And this is one of the things there that our laboratory has been trying to educate technologists, engineers, um, commissioners for quite some time. We call it sort of transactive uh, market structure. The underlying functionalities behind it is sort of grid architecture. So where you get an understanding in a systems approach that it says, who is influencing whom? Technologically, <coughs> organizationally, and from a market perspective. So there are buyers, information, of services. The service can be an energy service. You sent me some electrons measured in kilowatt hours. I'm giving you some load relief measured in kilowatts for a duration of 10 minutes. So these are different products. And you have these products already in place. 
um, this gets really very, very minutely and thoroughly discussed so that you can have a market that can be more and more automated, it can be nested down from, a, from the wholesale market down into the distribution system, down into the home. So if this principle really works on the wholesale market, can you recursively step it down into the distribution system, resolve the congestion that it does very well, power system, now do it within the home. And if you want to minimize your costs in a home, you actually limit yourself on something, either on energy or on demand, if you have a demand charge to it that really drives up the bill. So you can size it by recursively going down from the big bulk power distribution home. Trying to communicate this, this message out there as being one that might be applicable there for a much more transactive market. Uh, you had a speaker here, Bruce Nordman from LBNL. He's one that gets it. Um, he's working California Flex, Flex Hub system, where they also prescribe to the notion is that we need to automate. Uh, so you, 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 you cannot do these electric vehicle charging or the temperature set points by hand. People forget about it. It needs to be automated. People don't do it. So this gives you here an example of how you might do it in an electric um, vehicle context. And so think of this as an electric vehicle for the first time. So the electric vehicle needs to say is what it wants, right? So if I come home with my electric vehicle and the battery is fully empty and it's the weekend, I'm not anticipating to drive. I might say is, look, have it done, have it charged, fully charged by the end of the weekend. Or I may say as well, the next morning I wanna go hiking, gotta have it done the next morning. So I tell it done next morning. I, or I need to do another errand uh, and I need to say, look, I, I, I'm so low, I gotta have something, I gotta have it now. So you need to communicate what, what the vehicle needs. And then you need to have somebody that offers the vehicle something and the vehicle offers something back. And this is this sort of transactive exchange. So there's some communications going on. What you got, an electric vehicle, I can give you, I need 60 kilowatt hours within the next 10 hours. If you want to interrupt me, please do so. But I need to, at, in eight hours, I need to have 60, 60 kilowatts. And my charger is a 10 kilowatt charger. Do whatever it's best for me. Right? And so that needs to be somehow embedded in the electronics. And then there has to be something on the EVSE side, right? on the charger side has to be, well, I can offer you something. What can I offer you? This is my rate, right? If I do it at home, it's sort of trivial because it never changes, but may change. But if I go cross country, right? I go to a different locale, I plug it in. All of this has to start from scratch, right? Not to mention all of the cybersecurity that has to be overlaid. Over this. If you've never charged them. So there has to be some communications. And so how do we automate this electronically? So what people have done in the last 10 years is a lot of WE people were involved in it. Very precise people are saying is, I need to be able to communicate to the next, to the next device. So now, communication stand between EV and EVSE. And people build careers out of it. People have businesses out of it to get this communication done. And it all follows their certain I, uh, ISO or IEC standards, international standards. Right? And so if you can plug it in and say, yep, you know, I recognize 
This is a Tesla. This is a Volvo. This is what needs a heck lot more. Then people said, all right, so I need to have communication if I run a charging hub between sort of a centralized computer there and all the different uh, EVSEs. And so an OCPP started out, out of Europe. Um, and so now they looked at what's the use case for this particular scenario. It's, it's usually really demand limiting. So I only have a megawatt. I got hundred charging stations there. If they all blast, they blow the fuse, right? So I need to orchestrate it. I need to say, you can charge a little bit, you gotta wait, and if he's done, you can start. So I need to orchestrate it. And that's what OCPP does. Right? And so then open ADR and LBNL has, has pushed it, says, well, I wanna do demand response from a utility. To whom do you send it? Well, I need to send it probably not straight to the car, but I need to send it to an intermediary, right? And so this all works, except, except that standards, each of these standards allow interpretation of how you implement it. And so they have these big test votes there out there big parking lots in, where were the last ones? There's some in Michigan, so there was some in California, at uh, Long Beach, big parking lots, and the car manufacturers came with their vehicles, the Siemenses, the ABBs came with their charging stations, and some generators there to say, all right, so let's plug all in. You know, and they plugged it all in, and they did some demand limiting, and all of a sudden, something doesn't work. And so the room, of interpretation is sufficiently large that you don't have plug and play. It just doesn't work. So how come that it doesn't work? How come that you're going to Europe, you find Europe, you're turning on your phone, and it works? Well, because there's some conformance testing. There's no end-to-end -end conformance testing here yet. Furthermore, furthermore, so if there is Tesla, and there's the auto bidder there that has a deal there, and they're pretty active in, in Texas, is, is allowing you uh, or is, is controlling you based on some arrangement when you're charging and how you're charging your vehicle at home. So they're controlling from Tesla headquarters. And, uh, so they're doing all of these controls based on probably some bulk power pricing in Texas. So you have a day ahead price, you see this, what the prices will be tomorrow, and that drives their scheduling. But so now you have an old neighborhood, pretty wealthy neighborhood, there's some Teslas there, and they're reaching local congestion. So you're starting blowing because the transformers doesn't really know why Tesla is scheduling something that has relevant, not in the local context, but in the bulk power system, right? And so the distribution company needs to be aware what Tesla is doing locally. And that is where the clearinghouse comes in. So that concept doesn't exist yet. So there's a big hole need to fill. So there has to be this coordination there among different players in order for these processes to work properly. And, and then, as I mentioned before, is one of the biggest issues is, is you're expecting that systems are working interoperably. Like your cell phone, anywhere in the country, any device, any manufacturer, Android or Apple, it just works. And somehow these companies have tested it, the conformance there, that wherever you are in the nation, wherever you are worldwide, the darn thing works. But we don't have an entity that is there that says, I'm responsible for everything on the utility. 
and I'm responsible for everything that happens on the charger, and I'm responsible for everything that happens in the car. Because it has been all in pillars. And these organizations and these countries have not talked to each other. So there needs to be a new certification entity yet to be determined that handles all of this. So there's a whole other story there on the cybersecurity, how to handle certificates. Also not how to do this. So we need to have somebody with a with a mindset of understanding the technical challenges, but then turning this into how are we directing industry to make the right decisions so that the consumers benefit from it. And this is coming back full, full loop back to where it started off with the three-legged three stool. Who is the entity there? Who is driving? Who is driving the, the policy and regulation? We need to have smart people that understand all of these complication legal issues, technological issues, and key market drivers. And so I want to raise the bar for you all, you know, aspiring to move the needle somewhere and, and to change the world. There are, there are people in the probably not so sexy policy and regulation requirements that really need the brightest, the brightest of, of you all. Thank you. <laughs>